Okay, so let's start our class. And uh, number one, I wanted for everybody to make it to class because there was still a couple of couple of students that hadn't quite come in yet. But now we have uh, we have about thirteen. There's still a couple that are missing, but that's right. We'll 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 start. We'll start now. Um, and uh, let's see where we left off last time. Last time, that was class one. And then we did class two. And then we did class three. And uh, I think, let me see. Did we make it to characters? Yeah, we made it to characters. And we stopped right here. Okay, so somebody, did Nicodemus die in the original? Um, can somebody, why don't we, no, I don't think, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think he died in the original. Um, and Jenner, and Jenner already died. Uh, Jenner hadn't been in the story uh, since, uh, since they, 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 they they went out of them. I see. Now let me see. Um, you know that's a good question. Uh, let me let me Google it. Did Nicodemus Nicodemus die in Oops. Yeah, he died. You see. It seems that he died. It says he was next. Uh, he was next seen standing on a rock watching the movie, the moving of the Brisby home. Unfortunately, he was unaware of Jenner's plan to kill him until it was too late. Jenner cut the ropes, causing the construction to break apart and crush him. Nicodemus to death. He had sacrificed himself to save Brisby. Um, so, um, yeah. It, in the original my book, it doesn't says this part. It says Nicod uh, at the last Nicodemus still uh, still told everyone to to move to the uh, mountains. Ah, okay. So, um, all right. So let's let's go back. Let's see. Hold on a second. Let me uh, give me a second here. My wire came off of my computer. Hold on. Let me do this. Let's go back a little bit. Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a tough, stubborn male character in the book, portrayed as having an eye patch and a long scar along the side of his face. He is the leader of the genetically engineered uh, rats. He gives us an inside look into the society of rats and how their organization operates. Nicodemus is the smarts of the colony and is known for giving rhetoric speeches and being the voice of reason. But it doesn't say whether he died or not. And over here, it says that he did, that he died. But I think this is the film. Um, give me a second. Died in the Rats of Nim. Hold on. Hold on a second. 
Like in the film, there's many changes. Yeah, hold on. It says Nicodemus was an old prophet in the secret of Nim. Uh, that was in the secret of Nim. That's not in the in Mrs. Frisbee. That's the secret of Nim. See you over here. That summary perception related. You know, I don't know. In the in the movie, he died, but in the book, in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, um, Nicodemus is in your typical leading man in the story of his life. He he wouldn't be played. So maybe. Uh, Jeff Bridges minus a tail. In any case, the black patch that he wears uh, around an appearance. Of course, Nicodemus doesn't start out that way. Uh, come from he liked the games, the joke, and uh, now you might be asking yourself why all Nicodemus gets a top spot. His interest, how capacity is colony. He's the main narrator. Um, he is also brilliant. In addition uh, to being our guide and storytelling, he is also the biggest fan of the plan when Jenner, his oldest and best friend, decides to bail on the plan because he thinks it will be too hard. Nicodemus makes an impassioned plea for the importance of the plan, going so far as to say we're just living on the edge of somebody else's civilization, like fleas and stuff like that. Nobody wants to be thought of when he believes that in order for the rats to have progress, they have to move beyond what's, what everybody else considers rats to be. Um, let's say uh, when they force, well, all he can do is soldier on to find, let's see. I don't think he dies in the book. It doesn't seem that he dies. All he can do is soldier independent will prove itself to be the smartest thing to find out whether or not that proves true. We'll just have to go read the sequel. Yeah, but there's no sequel. No, you know, in the book, he doesn't die. In the movie, he dies, but not in the book. Uh, book, so is it because is it because uh, the movie is the secret of Nim, not the rats of Nim? Right, not the rats of Nim. Right. So the movie is a little bit different from the book, just a little oh. bit. And in the movie, they killed him, but uh, in the book, he keeps on going. He keeps on fighting. So, uh, mm -hmm. so that, well, that hopefully that answers your question. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure, no problems. Now let's uh, let's go back. Let's see what we've covered so far, and we covered all the chapters. Uh, we all the chapter summaries. We covered the characters. I gave you guys a lot of information about things like protagonist, antagonist, uh, the arc, uh, typical the archetypes, uh, the the plot arc of a, of a story, of a movie, or a book or whatever, uh, we talked about the different types of uh, characters that, are, that will be in books and things like that, like the, uh, the, the archetypical mother, the villain, the bad person, the good guy, the hero, uh, the sidekick. You know, so we talked a, 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 about a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that it's good for you guys to know so that next time you know, you're reading a book, you can sort of understand what is going on? Uh, but today we're we're going to go through words. We're going to do a glossary, and the word glossary means a list of words that are relevant to the book or to the story that you're reading about or that you're watching on on a movie or whatever. So it's not a dictionary. A dictionary is a book that covers all the words in any particular language. 
but a glossary is a limited, limited amount of words that are relevant to the conversation, relative, uh, relevant to whether you're reading a book or whether you're watching a show or whether you're having a conversation with other people. That's what a, what a glossary is. So it's a much smaller list, but it's, it's a list that makes it important for you to understand what the story is about. Anyway, so first on the list, we have the, the word frenzy, frenzy. And frenzy means that things are happening very quickly, right? Kind of like in a rush, sudden movements, um, craziness, um, you know, so if people go to a New Year's Eve party and are in a frenzy, it means that they go to this party and they start just going crazy, you know, they start uh, talking, rushing around, moving around real quickly and things like that. So the word frenzy, that's what it means. Snaky line, snaky line. So snaky line in a blurry wavering line. So a snaky line is kind of like a meandering line. The word meandering, meandering means when you zigzag like this. So when you're studying, uh, when you start studying geology or geography or anything like that, sometimes you will come across a meandering river, a meandering river. And a meandering river is kind of like a snaky line. It's kind of like a snaky line. You know, there are many ways of describing it. You can say a snaky line, you can say meandering, and I'll write it down for you. Me and the ring like that. So that's kind of a snaky line. In fact, in the state of Idaho, on the western part of the United States, there is a river called the Snake River. It's called the Snake River. And it's a very famous river in Idaho, the Snake River. And uh, they call it the Snake River because it's a meandering river. It's a meandering river like this. It's a river that meanders. It's a river that kind of zigzags. That's another word, zig, zag, zigzag, like that. And zigzag, it means that it goes from one side to the other, it zigs and it zags from left to right, left to right. So that's a snaky line. Inkling is a, a small amount, a sense or intuition. So there are two meanings to the word inkling. And one is a little bitty something, a little small amount. But you can also say, I had the inkling that something bad was going to happen. I had the intuition that something bad was going to happen or that something good was going to happen. Or I had the inkling that it was going to rain today. So inkling, the way that it's most commonly used is that it's intuition. In other words, you get a thought in your mind that says something's going to happen and you're not quite sure what it is. Um, and that's usually the most common way of using the word inkling, even though you can also say a small amount, an inkling of bread, an inkling of milk or something like that. So those are the two words. But again, as I say, the intuition is the, the way most likely 
that it will be used. Plowed. So the word plowed, the word plowed comes from, the word plowed is either, it can be a noun or it can be a verb. It can be used both ways. Uh, you can say a plowed field or I plowed the field. And it comes from the word plow, plow. And plow is also a verb and a noun. So the farmers, they plow the field. They plow the field and they use a plow. <laughs> they use a plow. They use a machine that um, they use a machine. They have a tractor. In many cases, they have this big tractor, right? Like this. And then the farmer sits up here driving the tractor. And behind the tractor, there is a machine. There's a machine that has blades, that has these big, big blades like that, right? And has many of these, many blades, usually four or five rows of blades, right? And as he pulls this machine, these blades go into the ground and they dig, not a hole, but they dig a canal. They dig kind of like a canal. So dirt goes on one side over here, dirt goes on this other side over here, and this part will be deep, maybe four inches, you know, which is, what would that be? That would be like, you know, 10 centimeters. They use the trench. They throw yeah. seeds into the trench, trench, right? They, yeah, the, it, the, the plow makes a trench. That's a very good word, trench. It creates this and trench. The, the farmers throw seeds into the trench, right? Right. So the, the plow creates a trench, and then the farmer throws seeds in there. The, the farmer puts seeds in there, covers up the seeds with the dirt, and then four or five months later, something grows. Maybe corn, maybe string beans, you know, something like that. Potatoes, but the only thing potatoes grow inside of the ground, they're more like a root, you know, they're more like a root. So this is a plow as a noun, right? But it's also to plow, which is a verb. So you can plow something, to plow. So you can say, I plowed the field, right? I plowed the field. I uprooted the ground so that, and created a trench so that later we can put seeds. And, and thank you, that's a very good word, trench. I couldn't think of it. I was thinking canal, but it's not a canal, right? A canal is much bigger. In the lee. Now, in the lee, this is what's called a, an idiomatic in expression. The shelter. Huh? In the shelter. Yeah. Um, so in the lee means in the midst of something or in a specific area. Now, this is what's called an idiomatic expression, because unless you know what it, what, you know, what it refers to, uh, the, the words themselves don't tell you um, what's going on, right? Doesn't, they don't tell you what's going on. So this is called an idiomatic, idiomatic, expression or an idiom you can also say an idiom expression right so this is an idiomatic expression or an idiom that says in the midst of something so in the lee in the midst of something now it's not very commonly used i haven't heard it used in many 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 years and that's because 
um, when this book was written, you know, it was many years ago. And expressions, you know, they kind of they kind of go away after a while. Now the word skimming, uh, which means to graze or to lightly brush. So, um, so I, I, let me see if I can give you an idea to lightly go over the surface of something. So let's say that you are in a motor boat that is a catamaran. And I don't know whether you know what a catamaran is, but a catamaran is a boat that skims the surface of the ocean as it sails. It doesn't touch the water so much. It just barely skims it. It barely goes over the top. Uh, what's one of the longest books you have read? Oh my God. Or no, Harry Potter. Yeah, you know, Harry, pa Harry Potter is pretty big. Uh, but uh, what about the, uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings? That's a really big book. The, uh, the Hobbit and then the follow-up, which was the Lord of the Rings. That's a three volume book. And I read it many years ago. I read both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah. The Miserable is another one. Yeah, absolutely. Those are really big, big books. Anyway, so that's what skimming is. It's just barely touching the surface, barely touching the surface. Um, so those are some of the expressions that... Uh, that are used in the book that perhaps, you know, maybe you really don't know much about. Um, and again, as I say, Robert C. O'Brien, which that was not really his name, but nonetheless, that was the name that he used when he wrote, um, wrote the book many years ago. And a lot of those expressions are just not, no longer around. They're just no longer around. So let's, uh, let's go into the next section, section, which is themes. And themes are ideas or messages in a book that are real The message the author wants to send through a book. That's right. It's the, the message that the author wants to give you they are reoccurring, you know, they happen over and over again so that you kind of get the message of what it is all about, okay? So let's look at some of the themes that we see in the book. Number one, the word pers perseverance. Does anybody know what the word perseverance means? What does it mean? Does anybody know what is what is perseverance? Does it mean uh, giving up, being tough, and doing what you should do? Well, perseverance means not giving up, not giving up, continuing no matter what. Um, so you persevere, you don't give up, and it's kind of like the saying. There's a there's an old saying that the teachers used to tell us all when I was a kid, and they, they used to say, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again, right? If at first you don't succeed, try and try again. So if at first you don't get something, you're not able to accomplish something, don't give up. Just keep on trying, because eventually you're going to be able to accomplish it. You know, eventually you're going to be able to accomplish it. So this is one of the messages that the author wanted to tell us about uh, with his book, right? And that is perseverance, not giving up. A common theme from Nicodemus' point of view is perseverance. When he and the other rats get trapped by the scientists that are looking to genetically modify them 
Nicodemus never gives up hope. He never gives up hope. And is always trying to find freedom. The book always portrays him as constantly trying to get out of the cage and getting out into the open world. This is the advantage of being a rat. Since rats have been through such hard times in society and have learned to cope. Give me a second here. I gotta get rid of this little floating thing. Through such hard times in society and have learned to cope with these kinds of hard situations. But Nicodemus didn't allow the hard situations to discourage him, get him to stop or give up. He persevered. He continued and continued and continued until he succeeded. If at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Stereotypes in society. Now, this is very important because a stereotype is when we think that somebody represents everyone else, right? You have in your mind a stereotype that girls are not strong. So you say, oh, girls are not strong. And that means that this girl here, she's not strong. All the girls in the world are not strong, but that's not true. There are girl athletes, right? Girls who are great tennis players, girls who are great runners, girls who can even lift weights, right? And that's a stereotype. And in society, a lot of people have stereotypes. You know, they say, um, well, if you, if you're tall, you know, you must be a good leader because tall people make good leaders. Well, that's not true. I've known tall people that are really not good leaders at all. Um, or maybe you say the opposite. You say short people don't make good leaders, but I've known some shorter people who are great leaders, right? I mean, think in history, Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, the French general who created such problems in Europe because he wanted to take over Europe. He was short. He was only five foot seven. And the soldiers under his command were tall. They were much taller than he was. But historians say, that Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest leaders ever because his men, his soldiers would follow him anywhere. So a stereotype is when we think that just because one person is something, everybody that are like this person do it the same way, right? So, and we don't want to do stereotypes. Um, we don't want to stereotype anyone. We don't want to do these things that are generalities, you know, where we say um, everybody that does this are all the same. Because the reality is um, everybody's different in this world. Everybody's different. We're all different, we're all different, regardless of whether we're from one race or another race, or whether we're from one culture or another culture, we're all individuals and we're all different. This can be clearly distinguished in the book between the mice and the rats. The rats are the bottom of the food chain. The rats are known to be vile creatures that steal from other animals to make a living and a life. Rats are commonly associated in the book with a pest such as fleas. 
Mice, on the other hand, are more civilized and less inclined to involve themselves in dangerous situations. They're always hiding from predators, but successfully making a living and are content in their home lives. So the book sort of stereotypes, but of course, when you stereotype animals, that's a little differently, right? That's a little differently because animals do behave pretty much the same, right? Dogs behave like dogs and cats behave like, behave like cats and rats behave like rats and birds and so forth. But when we think that humans have that same quality, have the same quality all the time, that's when we, that's when we have problems. And that's when we begin to stereotype people in society. And we really should not do that. Language and communication. We're guessing that since you're here, you probably care about reading a lot. But do you care about it as much as the characters in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim do? For Nicodemus and company, reading is about much more than simply learning a story. For them, reading provides them with hope and eventually the means to escape from Nim and all its horrors. Still, even though reading gives them so much, it also proves to be a burden to the rats as they realize that their new knowledge and skills mean that they will never fit in with others of their kind again. Knowledge may be power, but it can be a bummer too. You know, yeah, I think that for the rats, them being the only ones that are intelligent might not be that good because they're gonna come across other rats that are not as intelligent as them and they're never gonna be able to fit in. However, for us, for humans, that's a totally different thing. For us, learning is important. It's important in many ways. Number one, when we learn, we know how to solve problems, which the rats did, right? They solved a lot of their own problems. And humans, we're the same. We need to be able to learn in order to solve problems. This is what's called critical thinking. And I'm going to write it down for you. Critical thinking. Critical thinking. And critical thinking, we learn to think critically, meaning that we can make decisions. We learn to think critically by reading a lot and by learning a lot, learning about all kinds of different subjects, learning about math and science and especially history, learning what happened in the past, what's happening right now, and then trying to figure out what's gonna happen in the future, right? Um, critical thinking is a very important practice. And uh, doctors, for instance, they do critical thinking when they're trying to cure you of a disease. Doctors use a method called deductive reasoning. It's called deductive, deductive reasoning. And what deductive reasoning means is that you look at reasoning, you look at different possibilities and you decide which possibility is most likely to be true. 
for instance, you go to the doctor and you say, doctor, doctor, I have a tremendous headache. My head is about ready to explode. So the doctor says, okay, so what are the options when somebody has a headache? So he's going to start, he or she is going to start asking you questions. He or she is going to say, okay, that you hit yourself in the head. You say, no, 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 I, I did not hit myself in the head. Um, do you have allergies? And you say, no, no, I don't have any allergies. So he can get rid of this possibility, right? You said you didn't hit yourself in the head, so it's not that. And then when he asks you whether you have allergies, you say, no, I don't have any allergies. And, you know, allergies can cause your sinuses to get uh, infected, and then you get a headache, right? So you say no, so he gets rid of that one. And then he looks through books or in his mind about other possibilities. And he says, did you eat something last night that upset your stomach? And I know that maybe you guys know that if you eat something that upsets your stomach, you not only get a stomach ache, but maybe later you get a headache. And then you say, no, 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 I didn't eat anything. So he gets rid of that possibility. So he goes through all the different possibilities that he knows of as a doctor, okay? That he knows of as a doctor. And then eventually, and he gets rid of all of these, right? And then eventually he asks you a question and you say, oh yeah, yeah, I've got that problem. Maybe he asks you something like, uh, have your ears been hurting recently? Because, you know, if you get a clogged ear, sometimes you're going to get a headache too. And you say, oh, yeah, yeah, my ears. I've been having problems with my ears. So now the doctor focuses in on the ear, right? So he got rid of all of these, got rid of them. This is what's called deductive reasoning because you deduct, you get rid of things that are possible, but that are not real, right? things that are possible, but that are not real. Now, he looks inside of your ear and he sees that maybe you have a little infection, right, in your ear. And he says, okay, so I, we can treat this in some ways, you know. We can do an ear wash. We can, I can give the patient antibiotics. I can, you know, so they, he tries that. He or she tries that, cleans your ears, and then you say, oh, but still, I'm still having problems. And then, you know, he tries something else. And again, he's doing deductive reasoning. And finally, he says, okay, I'm going to give you antibiotics. And then when he gives you the antibiotics, you improve, right? You improve. So deductive reasoning. And how do you get to deductive reasoning? How does a doctor learn to do this? Well, he learns it in medical school. And he learns it by studying a lot and studying the human body a lot. And then all that knowledge, he stores it in his brain. And then he's able to use it later when he needs to, right? So in the case of the rats, though, this kind of knowledge might have not been all that good might have had some drawbacks. But for us, for humans, the more you read, the more you learn, the more you learn, the more successful in life you're going to be, the happier you're going to be, the more that you're going to be able to accomplish. So it's very important. This is very important. Families. That's another theme that the author wanted to let us know. Families come in in all shapes and sizes. And in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, they come covered in fur. <laughs> They're furry little animals, right? 
though messages about the family come up often in rats, the messages are consistent. Family is really important and worth a sacrifice. It is always worth for you to sacrifice yourselves for your family. But it is there such a thing as taking too many risks for your family? Is there? Mrs. Frisby thinks not. What do you think? What do you think? Mrs. Frisbee will go to the end of the earth for her family. Would you go to the end of the earth for your family? Many of us would do that, right? Many of us would do that. There's a saying, there's another saying that says, blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. And what that means is that Family, we consider family to be our blood. And, uh, and if blood is thicker than water, it means that blood is much more important than water, which is, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. We can say that water may be our friends and family is blood. So your family will always love you. Your friends, well, maybe they come in, they go out. Maybe you know somebody for a little while and then that person moves away. You never see him again, see him or her again. So, uh, so families are very, very important. Mrs. Frisbee's willingness to put herself at risk to save Timothy tells us that while her mot motivations are kind, they're not exactly well-reasoned. Risking her life to save the life of Timothy only puts all her children's lives at risk. How does that math add up? So, you know, maybe somebody could say to Mrs. Frisbee, well, be careful. It is good for you to risk for Timothy, take some risk for Timothy, but make sure your other children don't suffer the consequences. But still, if you're a mother or if you're a father, you know, you're really not going to care about that. You're going to give your life for your children. And even for one child, you're going to give up your life. Mrs. Frisbee's willingness to risk all for her family shows that she's just as brave as the rats. The rats are willing to risk all to be independent because that's what they care about most. Similarly, Mrs. Risk, Mrs. Frisbee will risk everything for her children because she cares about them more than anything. You know, again, like I say, blood is thicker than water. And if we compare, we say blood is family and water is friends, well, there you go. Your family will always be with you. Your family will always love you. The home. Here's another theme that the author keeps on bringing up. Not only do hum homes provide safety and refuge from dragon, remember a dragon, the cat, and the owl on a bad day and other dangers, but they also tell us a lot about the characters living in them. Mrs. Frisbee's home is snug and comfortable. And we know she would do just about anything to protect it. The rat's home is palatial. Oh, this is a big word, guys. Palatial, palatial. Can anybody tell me what the word palatial means? It comes from the word palace. Palace. What is a palace? Does anybody know what a palace big is? Big house. Just learned it today. Yeah, big, big house. A big, big house is a palace. So when you say that a home is palatial, this word today. right? It means that it's as big as a palace. That it's as big as a palace. 
So the rat's home is palatial compared to the Frisbee cement block. And its size and grandeur tells us just as much about the rats. Even more importantly, home is where the people or animals you care about can be found. And all of the characters in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim would do anything to protect those they love, to protect those they love at home, right? There's another saying, home is where your heart is. Home is where your heart is, right? Your love, your heart, your feelings, everything that you see as good is in your home. It's in your home. So home is where the heart is. In Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, homes tell us something very important about the characters who live in them, what they hold most dear, even though the cinder block is cozy and homey. Cozy, right? When you get in the bed and it's a cold night and you put the blanket over you and you become all cozy and warm, right? And the rat's burrows are impressive in the novel. Home is much more about the relationship of the characters than about the physical space they live in. And that's why the saying, home is where the heart is. Because the house, the house is not a home. The house is nothing. The house, if it's made out of wood, is a bunch of pieces of wood that get put together with a roof, right? And a kitchen and windows and stuff like that. A house but is a home, building you live in. A home is where you live. Yeah, the home is home where you're is more Right. The home is where your family is. The home is where your family is. The satisfaction. In Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, the satisfaction is the feeling that propels the whole plot forward. Right? Why? Because the rats are dissatisfied. Satisfied, dissatisfied. So if you're satisfied, you're happy. If you're dissatisfied, you're not happy, right? Here's the thing, the rats could have covered their heads with their blankets and ignored those nagging feelings that something is dreadfully wrong in their lives. But the stat I think the thing is that they're stealing a lot of things. All their electric electricity is coming from the Fitzgibbon's house. Yeah, okay, good that something is dreadfully wrong in their lives. But does that sound like the rats we know from this book? Not in the slightest. After their escape from them, the rats experience feelings of dissatisfaction when they begin to understand both, that they have been changed forever and that their old way of living is based on stealing from others. And that dissatisfaction drives them to take charge of their lives. Right? Once they realize this, then they take charge and they say, from here on out, we're going to be the boss. We're going to do what's right for us. Civilization is pretty tricky in this novel. Sometimes it's positive, but sometimes it's the very thing that causes characters to hurt one another the most and to feel the most dissatisfied with life. O'Brien uses dissatisfaction as a way to teach us something about the characters in this novel. The very best characters are the ones who use dissatisfaction to their own benefit. So, and this is part of conflict, right? I think I told you one time, or maybe I didn't, I'm not sure. But in fiction, in novels, for novels to be exciting and to be uh, something that gets us 
wanting to read and read and read is when there are when there is conflict, when something is happening. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you're reading a book about five high school kids that are sitting in the canteen, you know, in the cafeteria, and they're having lunch. And they're having a conversation. And it's a conversation about just stupid things, you know. So Johnny says to Mary, hey, Mary, how you doing? Mary says, oh, I'm doing okay, Johnny. What about you? Well, I'm doing fine. What did you do this weekend? Oh, me and Tommy, we went, uh, we played uh, softball. Oh, very nice. Right? And they keep on talking and talking and they spend an hour talking about real trivial, not very exciting things. Do you want to read that book or would you get bored with it after a while? If I'm reading that after about 20 or 30 minutes of reading it, I want to throw the book away because it's boring. But now imagine if you have five children, five high school kids sitting in at the cafeteria and they're having a conversation and then all of a sudden there's a big explosion in the kitchen with a, where all the kitchen workers are. Boom, huge explosion and a fireball comes out and the entire school starts burning and everybody runs for the door. But Mary, she says, no, I can't let the people in the kitchen die in the fire. So she runs into the kitchen and she starts dragging people out one at a time. And she saves six or seven different workers. Now that's conflict. She faced conflict. And the conflict was a human against some natural thing in the environment, right? Maybe a gas leak in the kitchen caused the explosion, right? She's not fighting somebody. She's not having conflict with somebody, but there is some sort of conflict and she faces the conflict and she saves a bunch of people and then Mary becomes a hero. Would that be, wouldn't that be more exciting to read when you have that kind of conflict? Now, in this novel, the satisfaction is the conflict. The rats are dissatisfied. And that the satisfaction moves them to do something, to move the novel forward. Because otherwise they would just sit there eating their little garbage every day and nothing would really happen. But that bit of dissatisfaction, whatever they are dissatisfied about, is what moves the plot forward. What allows us to see the cats, the rats, the best one of the rats, take on the conflict and try to overcome. And that moves the plot forward, right? So the worst thing you want to do is read something that is bland that there's no excitement, that there's no conflict, that there are no problems. But when we read something that there is some sort of conflict, some sort of problem, and you have one hero or one person or a group of heroes that want to take on that conflict and try to do good for everyone else, that's when we, that's when we appreciate a book a novel, a story, a narrative, whatever it is that we want to do. Sacrifice. Not to rag on humanity or anything. Okay, maybe a little bit. But if people could be a little more like the animal characters and Mrs. Frisbee and the rats of Nim, there might be more good news every day in the morning paper. It's not so much that the characters here are nice all the time. 
He goes, who wants to read about that all day long? Everybody's nice. Everybody's nice. Well, maybe we don't want to read about that all the time. Is that they have a strong moral code, which says that if someone has made a sacrifice for you, it is your responsibility to pay them back with a sacrifice of your own. That's also how the plot moves along too, right? So the plot, this is another bit of conflict, right? And that is that when something bad is happening, somebody among the group sacrifices of himself or herself to help everyone else. Mrs. Frisbee helps Jeremy. Jeremy helps Mrs. Frisbee. Because Jonathan Frisbee's helped the rats. The rats will help his family. And so on and so forth. In a long chain of furry animal goodwill that is downright heartwarming when you really think about it. These characters are always making sacrifices for each other. And sometimes it feels kind of unrealistic that they would do so much for someone else. The only way that the characters can survive in this dog eat dog or cat eat mouse world is through a willingness to sacrifice him or herself for the greater good, right? for the greater good. Let's do one more and then we'll, we'll stop. Identity. What is identity? What is your identity? What is your identity? Is your identity your name only? Or are there other factors in your identity? Are you a student? Are you a mother? Are you a father? Is that part of your identity? And Mrs. Frisbee and the rats of name, the animals have no choice but to figure out who and what they are. The rats need to figure out how to live with their new super abilities. And Mrs. Frisbee and her kids learn some surprising secrets about their family. Does identity mean figuring out, out life? No, it's identity is about you. It's about who you are. About who you are. So, you know, if you're driving or you're walking and then a police officer comes and says, let me see your identity card. Well, your identity card is who you are. Is who you are. Your name, where you live, what school you go to. Right? That's called an ID card, identity card. So identity is about you. It's about who you are. Which is all well and good, except for the fact that figuring out who you are and where you belong in the world is hard work. Sometimes we don't know who we are. We don't know where we fit. Okay? We don't know where we fit in the world. And as we grow older, we begin to figure all of that out. We begin to say to ourselves, I wanna be a doctor. I wanna be a nurse. I wanna be a teacher. I wanna be an engineer. And then that becomes part of your identity of who you are. The rats alternate between liking who they've become and feeling tormented by it. Mrs. Frisbee similarly has to come face to face with the fact that her husband kept a big secret as well as the fact that she is much more than just the sad old widow she thought she was. Figuring out who you are it's a real pain. It's very difficult. The rats spend too much time worrying about this when really they should just be focusing on survival. Even though it is painful for them, figuring out where they, where they belong and what type of life they want allows the rats to live up to their full potential. Okay, so let's leave it right here. 
and we will pick it up again next time. So, uh, you know, this is a good time to say something, to tell us what you think, to give us your opinion. So we're gonna say here that this is class six, class number six. And uh, so what do you think? What do you think? What kind of conflicts do you see in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim? What are the conflicts? Who are the protagonists? Who are the antagonists? Is the cat an antagonist? Um, uh, I think Nicodemus is kind of like Professor Dumbledore. Say again, speak a little louder. I think Nicodemus is kind of like Professor Dumbledore from Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. That's a very good observation. Yes, a very good observation. Okay, so it was great seeing all of you again. And uh, in a couple of days, we'll continue. We still have a lot of stuff to talk about with Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Later on, we're going to do some quotes, quotations, and stuff like that. So it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Okay, so as we always say, see you later, alligator. Bye. 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 Bye.